P-38 Lightning, the only successful twin boom World War II plane? The P-38's distinctive twin boom configuration wasn't merely aesthetic, it was a direct solution to a critical engine limitation. When Lockheed's chief engineer Hall Hibbard and his young assistant Kelly Johnson designed the aircraft in 1937, they faced a fundamental challenge. The Allison V-1710 engines produced tremendous torque that would have created unmanageable handling characteristics in a conventional single-engine design. Their solution, separating the power plants into twin booms, distributed thrust forces symmetrically, eliminating torque-induced handling problems while creating space for a heavily armed central nacelle. The P-38's twin Allison V-1710, F-2L, and F-2R engines counter-rotating to neutralize torque. Each delivered approximately 1,000 horsepower when introduced, later reaching 1,150 horsepower in subsequent variants. These 12-cylinder liquid-cooled power plants operated with a compression ratio of 6.65 to 1, relatively conservative compared to contemporary British Rolls-Royce Merlins. This compromise was deliberate. Allison chief engineer specifically designed these engines to operate reliably on 100 octane fuel when most European fighters required 120 octane. This decision proved pressure as fuel shortages plagued Luftwaffe operations while P-38 squadrons maintained operational readiness even with lower grade fuels. The cooling system revealed further engineering ingenuity. Each engine employed a pressurized glycol cooling circuit regulated through mechanical intercoolers with conventional temperature regulation systems. These maintained engine temperatures below 232 degrees Fahrenheit even during high power climbs through automatized cow flaps. Early models suffered from inadequate oil cooling, a deficiency discovered during Operation Bolero in 1942 when Colonel Ira Eaker documented numerous engine failures during Atlantic crossings. Chief Engineer Kelly Johnson personally redesigned the oil radiators, increasing their surface area by 13%, which dropped operational oil temperatures by 30 degrees Fahrenheit in subsequent J models. The twin General Electric B-13 turbochargers proved revolutionary but problematic. Positioned behind each engine, they enabled the P-38 to maintain 1,240 horsepower at 25,000 feet when contemporary fighters experienced significant power loss. However, the complex ducting system designed by GE engineer Sanford Moss created hazardous intercooler conditions at high altitudes when cold ambient air minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit at altitude hit the superheated aluminum intercooler surfaces. The rapid contraction caused metal fatigue. Colonel Benjamin Kelsey, USAAF test pilot, reported serious intercooler failures during high altitude tests at Wright Field in August 1941. This led to the development of field modifications that redistributed thermal stresses through flexible aluminum ducting and temperature regulating baffles. The P-38's top speed of 414 miles per hour made it the fastest American fighter in early wartime service, but this velocity exposed an aerodynamic phenomenon largely unknown to pre-war designers. Compressibility. During high-speed dives, airflow over the wings approached transonic speeds, creating shock waves that rendered control surfaces ineffective. Test pilot Ralph Verdon died investigating this phenomenon in 1941 when his P-38 failed to recover from a compressibility dive. Aerodynamicist Theodore von Karman at Caltech worked with Lockheed to diagnose the problem. His team discovered that the P-38's relatively thick airfoil, NACA 23016-23009, created powerful shock waves at Mach 0.68, earlier than contemporary fighters with thinner profiles. The solution came through two innovations. The dive flap, a hydraulically actuated 11 by 35 inch panel beneath each wing that disrupted airflow to prevent shock wave formation and extended wing fillets designed by Lockheed aerodynamicist William Clauser, who had conducted extensive research on boundary layer control. Commander of the first fighter group operating from bases in North Africa reported, the dive recovery flaps transformed the aircraft completely. Before the modification, we lost several pilots to compressibility dives. After installation, dive recovery was no longer an issue. The dive flaps became standard on all P-38J, 25LO models, and subsequent variants, effectively solving the compressibility crisis. The Lightning Central nacelle housed the most concentrated firepower of any American fighter, 4.50 caliber Browning M, two machine guns, and one 20 millimeter Hispano A in M2 cannon. This centralized arrangement eliminated the convergence issues that plagued wing-mounted weapons. Ordnance officer calculated that the P-38's central armament delivered significantly more accurate fire compared to wing-mounted equivalents at normal combat ranges. The Hispano cannon, manufactured under license from the original French or Swiss design, fired 20 by 110 millimeter shells at 650 rounds per minute with a muzzle velocity of 2,850 feet per second. Each shell contained 10 grams of PETN explosive, sufficient to disable engine blocks with a single hit. The cannon's feed system, however, proved notoriously unreliable. Lieutenant Charles McDonald of the 475th Fighter Group documented numerous cannon jams during combat missions over the Pacific in 1943. Armorer Technical Sergeant developed a field modification improving feed mechanisms, significantly reducing jamming incidents. The M2 Browning machine gun
guns delivered 840 rounds per minute each, with synchronized firing controlled through a conventional electrical trigger control system. This allowed pilots to select either full battery or machine guns, shot cannons separately. Colonel Richard Bong, America's leading ace who scored most of his 40 victories in P-38s with the 49th Fighter Group, noted, The Lightning's firepower was devastating. A short burst could tear apart any Japanese aircraft we encountered. The P-38's airframe employed several revolutionary manufacturing techniques. Unlike contemporary fighters built with aluminum tubing frames, Lockheed used flush riveted stressed skin construction throughout the airframe, a technique borrowed from their commercial aircraft experience. Structural engineer Willis Hawkins implemented advanced riveting processes that reduce rivet head protrusion to minimal levels, decreasing drag while maintaining structural integrity. The central nacelle utilized a semi-monocoque structure reinforced with transverse bulkheads, while the booms employed longerons with circular formers, who conducted structural tests at Wright Field, recorded that the P-38's wing could withstand exceptional G-forces before exhibiting permanent deformation, exceptional for an aircraft of its size. The Lightning's wing spars presented a unique engineering challenge. Each 52-foot wingspan required exceptional stiffness without excessive weight. Lockheed metallurgists developed specialized extrusion processes for the main spar, creating a complex I-beam profile from 75 ST aluminum alloy with varying thicknesses, thicker at the root tapering to thinner sections at the tip. This gradient extrusion saved significant weight per aircraft while maintaining structural integrity. However, the complex structure created maintenance challenges in forward airfields. Technical sergeant of the 8th Air Force's mobile repair units reported that wing damage required specialized equipment unavailable in combat theaters. This led to the development of modular replacement sections that could be airlifted to forward bases, a concept later standardized across USAAF operations. The P-38's hydraulic boost system represented the first implementation of powered flight controls in an American fighter. Using engine-driven PESCO pumps generating 1,000 PSI, the system reduced aileron forces by 65%, allowing pilots to execute high-speed rolling maneuvers impossible in conventional designs. Major Thomas McGuire, a P-38 ace with 38 victories in the Pacific, recalled, you could roll a lightning at high speed with minimal effort. Other fighters required considerable strength. This hydraulic system also powered the distinctive Fowler flaps, the first on an American fighter. Extended on tracks rather than rotating on hinges, they increased wing area by 17% when deployed, reducing landing speed to 90 miles per hour, critical for operation from compressed Pacific airstrips. However, the complexity of the hydraulic system proved problematic. Maintenance officer for fighter units in North Africa documented hydraulic failure rates significantly higher than contemporary P-47s, largely due to insufficient filtration in desert conditions. The Lightning's final evolution, the P-38L model, corrected most earlier deficiencies through hydraulic aileron boost, redesigned intercoolers, and strengthened electrical systems. With a power increase to 1,475 horsepower per engine, the L model achieved 414 miles per hour at 25,000 feet with combat load. Colonel Benjamin Kelsey, who had test flown the original XP-38 prototype and later served as a key procurement officer, remarked, the L model is what the Lightning should have been from the beginning. It resolves every significant complaint pilots had with earlier versions.